Okay, so we've got some speakers here with us in person today, so I'm delighted to introduce Nina Jokanovic and Diego Marin. On the live, on the in digital connection, we've got Dr. Maduri Karak and Mariana Riquito Pereira. And I'm now going to hand over to your moderator for the session, Maximilian Jung from Bits and Boimer. Thanks a lot, Ella. Yeah, welcome to Privacy Camp. Um, it's exciting to see um, all of you here in this room with us today, uh, being interested in our discussion on the materiality of digital technologies, um, on extractivism and on resistance uh, at Europe's front lines. Um, as Ella already said, my name is Maximilian Jung. I'm coordinating the Bits and Bäume Netzwerk um, on sustainability and digitalization. Um, and I will be hosting this discussion. Um, and thanks again to the tech team here at La Tricoterie for making this possible to be a hybrid discussion and, and thanks a lot to the content team of Edri and their partners um, in having us here. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick introduction um, and present our speakers and provide you a little bit with the background of why, why we're having this discussion here today. Um, and then you will hear from them about how extractivism and tech are related uh, what the resistance on the ground looks like and how different uh, futures for tech uh, are imaginable. And in the end, we will have plenty of time for your questions. So, as Thierry Breton said uh, two years ago at COP26, digital technologies are, are and must remain a positive force for climate action. And indeed, it seems the European institutions' um, priority in the past legislature to push ahead with the twin transition, the Green Deal and the digital decade, laying the policy groundwork for tech-powered solution and tech-powered solutions to the climate crisis, um, and trying to marry green extractivism uh, with sustainability and sort of without compromising on economic growth. Um, in Germany, we call it an egg-laying wool milk sow. So it gives you everything. It almost sounds too good to be true. Um, and to this end, um, securing necessary, the necessary raw materials for it uh, is, is key. Um, in parts, this is happening by onshoring mining back to Europe, although mining never left Europe. And often this concentrates in places uh, that are deemed peripheral, rural, underdeveloped, and just necessary to make a sacrifice for. Um, and maybe as one example of it, the Critical Raw Materials Act that uh, has been pushed through in immense speed. It was a tremendous piece of legislation uh, uh, that had a very broad support uh, across institutions and also in Parliament. Um, and so I'm happy to have four speakers with me here uh, on the stage today and online that will explain to you why green extractivism is a myth and how the twin, tra twin transition is actually uh, failing people and the planet and what the future for tech, uh, what future for tech uh, they want. So on to the speakers. Uh, with me here on the stage to my left is Nina Dukanovic. Uh, Nina is a doctoral researcher at the University of Oxford, focusing on local resistance to a lithium mining project led by Rio Tinto in Serbia. She operates at the intersection of scholarship and activism, supporting the local communities on the ground. Recently, she has also joined the Association of International Affairs, a Prague-based think tank where she focuses on the issues of mining, extractivism and material dependencies as part of their climate team. More broadly, Nina is interested in the questions around green extractivism, environmental justice, and the contested understandings of what the green future is to look like. Um, also with me here on the stage is Diego Marin. He is a master's graduate in international development from the University of Kent and works within the EBB's economic transition unit. His expertise lies in raw materials with a focus on environmental justice, geopolitics, and the circular economy aspects. Diego leads efforts in an analyzing the impacts of green and digital transitions while actively working on political strategies for a raw materials binding target across the European Union. 
As a co-author of the report, Green Mining is a Myth, the Case for Cutting EU Resource Consumption, he advocates for sustainable resource management, shaping a greener future for the European Union. And then on screen, we have Maturi Karak. Hello, Maturi. Nice to have you here. Uh, Maturi is an independent researcher and multimedia storyteller working at the intersections of climate, technology, and culture. She has supported indigenous communities, small-scale fishers and farmers, environmental and climate activists, digital rights practitioners, and open science advocates to secure and manage the commons. Her work spans landscape research, podcasts, narrative long-form, toolkits, and strategic community engagement. And most recently, she led a project mapping opportunities for a coalition building between climate justice and digital rights advocacy efforts across the EU. She currently lives uh, between Ankara, Turkey, and Calcutta, India. And last but not least, we have Mariana Riquito, who is a PhD candidate in social sciences at the University of Amsterdam and a junior researcher at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra. She holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in international relations from the University of Coimbra and a master's degree in sociology and political sciences from Sciences Po Bordeaux. Mariana is currently researching and writing about the contested realm of the so-called energy transition, exploring debates on extractivism, ecofeminism, ontological pluralism, and radical alternatives. She combines academic and activist practices, and she's currently living in the mountains of Barroso, uh, which she will tell us about in a few seconds. So thanks everyone for being here with me. I'm excited to have uh, this conversation with me, and um, with these words of introduction, I'm gonna pass it over. Uh, maybe first to Nina. Nina, would you like to tell us about your work? How do you witness the impact of raw material extraction? How does it relate to digital tech? And what role do you play in the resistance against it? Um, all right. Thank you so much, Max, for this lovely introduction. And thank you to the organizers for organizing this conference. It's lovely to be here. and. Um, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Nina Djukanovic, and as Max said, I am a PhD researcher looking at the case of Serbia. And perhaps for the introduction, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about this very particular story so you have an idea, uh, sort of a precise example of what I think about, what first comes to my mind when we talk about the green transition and the digital transition. The case in Serbia is very interesting because what was supposed to happen there is that the biggest lithium mine in Europe was supposed to open up last year in January 2022. The, the construction was supposed to start. It was very significant because in 2004, Rio Tinto, which is one of the biggest mining companies in the world, discovered a large deposit of lithium, which, as many of you will know, is a material that is um, understood as being critical both for the green transition and for the digital transition. So there is this material that is suddenly being cast as being absolutely fundamental for the future of Europe and if not for the world as a whole. And this mine was supposed to be constructed in the western part of the country, which is mostly um, very rural, where the local population focuses on farming and agriculture and has a very strong relationship with the land. And of course, while these materials are required, the mining process itself is extremely destructive for the environment. And so a huge number of the local population would not only be displaced, but even those who would uh, stay there would most likely be impacted by the pollution of their soil, water and air, which would of course impact very negatively their livelihoods. And so what happened is that a wave of mass protests started in autumn 2021 with tens of thousands of people protesting across several large cities in Serbia, blocking roads, bridges and highways for several weeks consecutively until they forced the government to officially cancel this mining project. So the government officially canceled the mining project in January 2022, which was a huge, huge victory for the movement and I would also say a huge blow to this understanding of green and digital transition as very smooth and very sort of <laughs> up in the air without any material consequences. Of course there would be huge material consequences but very often they happen outside of the view of, um, of the people who would be enjoying these products the most. 
Um, what is important to say, however, is that the company, of course, does not give up this easily because they already invested a huge amount of money and the government is also very supportive of this mining project, presenting it as a massive opportunity for the country to develop. Um, Serbia, interestingly enough, uh, is also a candidate uh, country in order to join the EU. And of course, this is being presented as a massive opportunity for an economic development and also uh, sort of getting closer to the EU. Um, the company still operates in the country and just a few days ago, uh, the president, Aleksandar Vucic, announced that he would like to renew the talks with the company following his meeting with them in Davos. And um, it is sort of very obvious that even though there are some environmental justice victories that we should be celebrating, um, they're also not over because these things take a long time and they require a complete rethinking of what we even understand as the green and digital transition. Um, maybe I'll stop there for now and yes, we'll follow up later. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nina. That's uh, already great inspiration, inspiration to hear from the victories that, uh, that you've scored so far in Serbia. Um, and with that, I would pass it over to Mariana, who's going to give us uh, some more context from Portugal. Hello, everyone. Uh, hopefully you can hear me well. Okay, great. I had some technical issues, but now they're all fixed. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Maximilian, for the invitation and to all, all the speakers. Thank you, Nina, for this wonderful introduction. Um, I will tell you a bit about the case study or the, what's going on in northern Portugal, and uh, in a way, it relates and is very similar to what just Nina uh, told us. Um, I can see. Are you hearing me well? I can hear. All right. Uh, yes. So basically, has. Some of you probably already know, um, in the northern part of Portugal, uh, in Bajuzu, uh, the British company Savannah Resources uh, aims to open what would be potentially Europe, Western Europe's largest open pit lithium mine. This project consists of four open pit mines, uh, the processing plant and the waste saving dam. Uh, it would uh, destroy almost 600 hectares of land. Uh, in a region that is classified by the UN as World Agricultural Heritage. So this is what just Nina told us. What we see here is that in the name of the so-called green transition uh, and in the name of uh, domestically enforcing this so-called critical uh, raw material, which is lithium, the EU is legitimizing more extraction in places uh, which are already uh, known and classified and protected for being incredibly important nature reserves in this case, and, and, as well as an agricultural uh, region. Um, and so uh, in Bajuzu, since uh, 2018, uh, the local population has been contesting this mine, um, which um, has not just the company's uh, will, but also the, the government uh, and the EU um, uh, yeah, uh, the, it is also approved uh, uh, by, the, by the Portuguese government and it's also seen as a common European project. And so the local communities have been uh, fighting up and resisting against uh, very big actors. Um, I would say we do not yet have a victory, but I would say in a hopeful manner that uh, we have been having slow victories. Uh, because the company wanted to have this mine open in 2019 already, and we're in 2024, uh, and the project is still not ongoing. However, last year it has received the um, final conditional approval, and right now the company has been having um, strategies on the ground which are um, becoming more and more aggressive. Uh, they are trying to um, get into communal lands because most of this project is located in communal lands where people communally own and manage their, their agricultural land. And they have been trying to get uh, and to get this uh, land since November. Uh, and people since November have been blocking and protesting and not letting the machines in. At the same time that we have seen this um, strengthening of the violence, uh, the physical violence, the material violence, uh, the state has also um, 
put a permanent police patrol uh, patrolling these these small rural villages. Uh, so we have seen an intensification of um, on the ground violence, which is the culmination of large efforts to socially engineer the acceptance of this project. Uh, so for the past years, uh, the company has been portraying itself as green, as responsible. Uh, the state has also been using this type of grammar and this type of discourse. Uh, the company has tried to approach vulnerable people in, the, in, the, in these villages, trying to buy them off, trying to approach influence families. Uh, and now, uh, because this has not yet worked, um, what we are witnessing on the ground is a strengthening of this at violent apparatus. So uh, I guess with the introduction of what's going on uh, in the mountains, is what I would um, what I would uh, say for now. Yeah, thanks, Mariana. Um, we had a little bit of difficulties understanding you at times, um, but I think we got the the large lines of uh, of your introduction. Um, and with that, I would hand it over to Diego. Uh, you also know the Barroso Mine. Uh, you also know a lot of other mining projects in uh, across Europe. Um, yeah. So, what do you see on what do you see on the ground? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Max, and uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I think it's really important to speak about the material reality of our world, and I feel like this is becoming now a topic in the last few years. Uh, not only because of the green transition, uh, but also the digital transition but also because of geopolitics. So there's a lot much more knowledge about um, the way we consume things and the material reality of it. Um, so, so yes, indeed, I have a, I'm following the uh, legislation at the EU level uh, related to uh, raw materials. And I've been to a few mining projects, uh, some in Peru, where I'm from, but also some in Europe. So in, in Europe, it's, it's really interesting because here, the European Union is really trying to push for supposedly green mining, right? Um, and it's doing that on, a, on basically making the claim before they can show the proof. And this is already all over Europe. Uh, particularly countries that are targeted are Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Finland, Sweden, um, and, uh, and, and Germany to some extent with lithium, but we don't see any major open pit mines just yet or in France, the case in southern France where there is a uh, mining project being uh, for lithium being pushed there. Um, we also see Romania, but this is more in the case of copper, and then Greece uh, also in the case of copper, uh, copper and gold particularly. Um, so there is mining in Europe, a lot of mining actually, and it's expected to increase uh, quite substantially. So the EU has a target of 10% uh, domestic extraction by 2030. And it's important to relate this to the proportionality of EU consumption. Um, so EU, right now, we make around 5 to 6% of the world's population. But we consume around 20 to 25% of the, of the world's material. We only produce 3% of that domestic, of, of that world output. And primarily it's in iron. Primarily Sweden is the biggest uh, exporter of, of iron in Europe. Uh, but we do also consume uh, and produce a lot of copper. Um, in the case of copper, which is used pretty much in every single electrical equipment, um, EU produces 20% of that, and primarily from Cyprus and Spain, as well as Finland and Sweden. Uh, and, and Finland is being uh, pushed for copper mining. So I've visited some mining companies. One recently that I've visited was in southern Spain. Uh, it's a, a company owned by a Cy Cypriot uh, mining company. It's Atalaya Mine. It used to be the old Rio Tinto mine region, so this is back 100 years ago. Um, but the area with what I saw there, after the push of green mining here in Europe, um, was just as bad as the conditions that I saw in Peru, in Cajamarca, which we have a huge region which is uh, particularly affected by copper mining there. And my biggest concern there was, of course, the up-and-pit mine, which is extremely invasive. Um, but what was more concerning for me was the, actually the waste management. So in Peru, we have a huge issue with what is called acid mine drainage. So this is, uh, in case you don't know, is um, basically when the acidity levels uh, reach a very low pH due to the, uh, the uh, pollution from the, from the rock, really, when you're trying to extract 
uh, and, it, and then this uh, sulfites really mesh in with oxygen and water and creates this really, really low pH levels. Um, and then it can actually, uh, due to the copper and the other minerals, can uh, turn the, uh, the water red. Um, so what happens there is, this is actually Rio Tinto, like kind of like there's those connections there, because uh, uh, Tinto means kind of reddish in, in, in Spanish. But anyway, so going back <laughs> to Cajamarca, uh, I saw this about five years ago when I visited uh, uh, um, the region and I was working with local uh, organizations there, an NGO that was really mobilizing to protect the land rights of the indigenous population and also non-indigenous population in the region. Uh, one of the biggest concerns was the uh, acid mine drainage, which was impacting uh, agricultural output. It was impacting also uh, uh, the drinking water conditions. Cajamarca has the highest rate of cancer, one of the highest rates of cancer in Peru, and is the, one of the most res uh, resource endowed regions in the country. So I saw the water, the water management there. I saw also when you're walking around in some areas where just the waste is just running down in beautiful areas of greenery where you can see nobody living around, but you see this waste just being pulled out. Um, and nobody really notices it except the local communities because they're the ones who are walking around and are seeing and they're reporting it to the state and the state's not really doing anything. I saw that in Spain, similar. It wasn't as bad in the sense that it wasn't in the middle of nowhere. But I was there at the tailings pond, and I saw reddish uh, acid mine drainage uh, uh, pollution all around the pond that was not actually in a, in a good waste. Uh, it was not in the tailings pond. It was outside of it. And uh, it had killed all the biodiversity around. So, now, this is, this is the thing about pollution. It is what you can see that you can actually say, okay, this is really bad. It is what you cannot see that actually takes time to develop and it develops into uh, pollution of the ecosystems, but it also develops into pollution of human bodies, right? And this is what we in environmental justice research, we look at this, we call it slow violence, right? It's a type of violence that is not hard, meaning fast violence, that is not like police brutality or whatever, though that does happen, but the type of violence that you can't really see firsthand, but you experience it in the, in the human body when you see the high rates of cancer uh, uh, in, in the population or breathing, um, uh, lung disease as well. Now, this is in this in, in this is kind of like to kind of put it together. Um, but pollution is not something that in the EU we're managing very well. And maybe just I could speak a lot about this, but maybe one last thing I'll I'll just mention when it comes to this uh, pollution issue or the green mining supposedly in, in in Europe is that in Europe we're pursuing mining where our legislation is actually not even as good as Peru, Brazil, Chile, or even China. And this is particular to mining waste. So in Europe, we allow what is called upstream mining tailings. Um, still, we, we haven't done away with it. And it is the cheapest way to manage mining waste. Uh, but it's also the most dangerous. Some companies are move, trying to move away from it from PR reasons, but in the legislation, you can still do it. And the issue that we found in Finland when we were doing this research, um, we found that also with, uh, uh, from research from uh, local organizations who had conducted this research as well, that the, uh, the filament, so basically the level of which the mining waste is able to uh, uh, meet with the ground, you have to have a certain level of, uh, of thickness, right, within the filament. Um, and this, is, this mining waste, by the way, is supposed to last hundreds of thousands of years because we have, as a society, we have not yet found out uh, a good way to deal with mining waste at the moment. There is developments, but it's meant to last pretty much forever. But mining companies, what they're doing is, with this mining waste, they're doing 20, 30, 40, 50 years mining waste management, after which they're gone, and the state then covers that. Um, but the issue now is that we're seeing a lot of mining waste dam breakings. The most recent one last year, I think it was in November or October, in South Africa. Um, so, and we're seeing this happen much more. And in Europe, our legislation is not there to, uh, to get rid of uh, these potential mining uh, issues. And anyway, so the thickness is really concerning because in Finland, supposedly one of the greenest mining countries, what have you, uh, some of the thickness for some of these new projects are about 100 times uh, thinner than they actually should be. So this is also this mining issue is actually an intergenerational issue because it's the future generations that are going to be dealing with this mining waste management that is just not suitable. So with climate change impacts uh, unfolding in the future in terms of extreme weather, 
Um, this is going to be a serious issue for mining waste management. So yeah, we can talk a lot about it, um, about these impacts, about how communities were involved in this, or, or, or even yeah, my own experience. But I just wanted to highlight my biggest concern when it comes to the raw materials challenge is, of course, the mining that happens, but really it's the mining waste, which is the most uh, impactful uh, potentially for, for going down the line into this uh, digital and green transition. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Diego. Thanks for highlighting an issue that maybe is uh, not, not a traditional concern in, in digital rights spaces, uh, the very materiality and also the, then, then the, waste, the waste of the material that we, that we leave behind. Um, and yeah, then now last but not least, uh, I'm going to hand it over to our last online speaker, uh, Maturi. Tell us about your work. Um, how do you witness the impact of raw material extraction? How does it relate to digital tech? And what role do you play in the resistance against it? Thank you, Max. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, your interest in these uh, topics. And Max will bring together this uh, super interesting panel. Um, and then, of course, Edri, um, where I've been a consultant researcher um, for the last three and a half, four months, um, conducting this uh, mapping exercise and you know, really trying to figure out what the existing avenues are for coalition building and better advocacy collaborations between climate justice and digital rights uh, folks. So in this opening set of remarks, I thought I'd share a few of my findings from the last uh, phase of research that I'm just uh, wrapping up. And then hopefully in the latter half of the panel, we can you know, tie some of these uh, threads to what some of my other co-panelists have uh, already mentioned. So four out of you know the 13 individuals that I spoke to for this mapping exercise identified themselves explicitly as climate justice practitioners. And then the remaining nine were a mix of digital rights um, advocates, some of whom were already working at this intersection, and then the rest you know, wish to do so more explicitly um, in the future. And you know, partly because of the timing of this uh, project, the Critical Raw Materials Act was you know, very much top of mind uh, for a lot of these uh, conversations. And you know, something to perhaps you know, point out as we move along is that, you know, the raw materials that we're discussing here, and I believe there are 34 of them in the final act. This includes you know, base materials, battery materials, rare earths. And this is not just for you know, consumer electronics, right? This is for material provisioning for everything from the defense industry to space exploration, light manufacturing. And so of course, you know, we are very much talking about the context of digitalization. Um, and the twin transition, I think it is important to remember how you know wide the spectrum of uses for rare earths are, um, and that then will you know make sense if we you know look at the geopolitical stakes, the kind of material self-reliance uh, agenda, the larger growth agenda that um, the European Union is so committed to. Um, and then the second bit would be that you know the CRMA itself is targeting everything from you know the mining, yes, but also the processing, also the refining, and then also the recycling. So it's got a very big remit and uh, has a lot of potential intersections with um, tech advocacy and digital rights um, work that I'm sure many of the audience members are engaged in. So. Um, jumping right in, look at the time. Okay, so we, you know, are already very knowledgeable about the environmental impacts of mining and that, you know, the water scarcity, the soil degradation, the air pollution, um, and advocates are seeing the use of tech tools when it comes to traceability, with the kind of goal being that every, you know, tool in the EU market that contains or product that contains rare earth minerals will have a label, you know, describing the point of origin. So not very unlike your uh, single origin fair trade coffee. Um, but you know what we aren't seeing really are you know conversations about tech transfer, for example, right, the big one, or um, 
support for point of origin countries with their own energy transitions, right, or contributions to climate finance. And, you know, thinking about labor, thinking about working conditions, thinking about inadequate compensation in these points of origin countries, then means we have to shift gear from supply chain transparency, which is what most of the current tech tools are you know, being proposed uh, to be used for, and not as much remediation and prevention of existing ground conditions. And that you know, includes mining within the European Union as well as um, other parts of the world. And the second big insight that you know, conversations uh, elucidated for us was the fact that free prior and informed consent concerns and indigenous peoples and local communities' rights, the violations are just egregious, right, in extraction zones. And getting these issues the right amount of exposure in Brussels is extremely difficult, which is why the work of you know, a coalition like the EU Raw Materials Coalition is super duper important. Um, with 50 plus organizations, you know, that's the kind of energy that they are bringing um, to raw materials advocacy in the EU context. And, you know, the last thing that maybe I'll say, you know, as I wrap up um, this uh, small segment is, you know, the reason why you know, we talk about the Brussels effect, right? And that's usually a positive connotation. But the reason that an act like this, a legislative uh, procedure like this, can be so devastating for resource-rich countries all over the world, even regi regions within Europe, is that a primarily extraction-oriented green transition you know, model within the European Union also puts other parts of the world on certain pathways, right? Social, ecological, political pathways um, that you know, arguably are going to continue to be, you know, very violent and lock them into these very raw materials centric um, futures. So to recap, what we are seeing is not as much due diligence, but more certifications, not as much a focus on remediation of ground conditions and rather, you know, tech focus, supply chain transparency, and then not as much of a timeline for transferring tech tech know-how or credit lines as much as just pursuing digitalization within the borders of the European Union. I'll stop here and then I'm sure we'll pick up on some of these threads in the rest of the yeah. panel. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Maduri. Um, you also, in the end, went full circle about the pressure that maybe the Brussels effect is then having not only on, on, on countries within the European Union, but as Nina mentioned in the beginning, um, Serbia trying to ascend into into the union and uh, then being maybe also under pressure for for then delivering those raw materials that we uh, so desperately need um, yeah maybe we can have one follow up one follow up round so you get the space to actually answer to each other I, i've seen nina you've taken a, a lot of notes um, while, while your fellow speakers have been speaking so maybe you maybe you want to react to what was being said in, the, in this first round um, yeah, sure, thanks. I think that's a great idea to also sort of have a conversation with each other rather than all of us speaking <laughs> to you in the audience. Um, where to start? Um, I think I was very interested to hear about the other cases, of course, as Mariana was talking about Portugal. Um, Diego mentioned all of the cases in the EU, and of course, um, now at the end we heard about how that is also going to have an impact on the rest of the world. And I think here what is interesting is that sometimes I hear this argument that we should mine more in the EU in order to be, of course, less reliant on the rest of the world, but also it is sort of this almost decolonial argument that by moving all the mining projects within the EU, we are going to have less of an impact on countries of the global south. Um, I think that uh, does make sense as an argument, and I see why it is appealing uh, on sort of the first look. But I think what we need to understand here, and maybe that's what I will use in this round to really emphasize, is how big and vast this need for the materials is going to be. 
even the International Energy Agency that is doing sort of long-term prognosis struggles to really uh, put a number to how much lithium or other critical raw materials we're going to need because it's constantly changing, but it is going to be tens, if not hundreds of, hundreds of times more than it is now. And so we are going to see so many new mines being opened up and so much more mining happening, both in the EU and outside of it, that Unfortunately, even moving all of the mining within the EU borders is not going to stop mining anywhere else. But what we're going to see, I'm afraid, is way more mining in all of the countries across the world that is going to have a very negative impact, uh, particularly on the local population, um, as Diego was mentioning here. And here maybe I will take a small moment also to bring this together with tech, because I think it's very important when we talk about lithium to also talk about what is this material going to be used for. And in the case of lithium, um, we expect to see it rise at least, as I said, tens of times. And what is interesting is that while just a few years ago, the usage of lithium was sort of divided half and half, half of it was being electric vehicles, and half of it was being any, everything else, including your phones, laptops, uh, also medicine, because the film is also being used in medicine. What we're going to see in 2050 is that more than 95% of lithium is just going to be used for electric vehicles. And most of these are really individual automobiles. So I think what is really important to emphasize here is that we're, when we're talking about this green and technological or digital transition, we're not only talking about um, these materials that are going to save the world because of climate change and all of that, but we're talking about a massive increase of profit for private companies, big economic growth that is mostly going to be seen in the rise of electric vehicles and um, individual automobility in general. And I think that's a really huge problem. And maybe if I can just add one thing that uh, one of the persons who I was interviewing in Serbia told me, um, she said that she would really support opening this mine in Serbia if she knew for a fact that by sacrificing her part of the country, we're really going to save the world. You know, she said, if it was like this, you know, I would be like, okay, there's going to be a lot of pollution and a lot of people will get displaced, but at least we're really going to solve this problem. At least we're really going to tackle climate change and we're going to save many more lives. But unfortunately, this is not true and this is not going to happen. We're going to open all of these mines so that some private automobile companies can have more profit and so that people can drive their cars thinking that they're saving the planet. Um, and that is something that I find very frustrating and something that I think we definitely need to talk more about and call these false solutions as such when they are so. Yeah, thanks Nina. thanks Nina. Thanks for focusing on the underlying uh, economic system at play here. And also, yeah, thanks for sharing um, what, what has been shared with you. Uh, Mariana, do you get similar reactions to, to the mine in, in Barroso? Is there people out there supporting the mine um, in, in maybe similar ways that they're saying, yes, we can mine here if, if it stops mining elsewhere? Or um, is, it, is it the same dynamics where where it is not really about uh, decoloniality and we, we onshore mining because we want to have our just part in, in, in destroying this world. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think partially uh, the justification for being against uh, mining in Bokozu are similar to what Nina just said. So people are really challenging this idea that to save the world, we need to uh, mine even further, and especially we need to mine protected areas. Uh, and they're really challenging the idea that saving the world means reducing carbon emissions slowly, and saving the world means building more electric vehicles because they are allegedly zero emissions. So the idea that electric vehicles are made up of uh, clean energy, of green energy, of zero emissions, um, is also false. People are really challenging this. And uh, as Nina just said, uh, they are putting to the table and showing how this is actually just business, the continuation of business as usual. This is a way for 
uh, two uh, huge industry which are widely known for being incredible polluters and for being the ones continuously destroying the planet, which is the automobile industry and the mining industry. This is a way for both of them to paint themselves as green or try to portray themselves as green and putting new clothes on and saying that now they are part of the solution, even though they were the ones and the main ones helping uh, to create the problem. So I think attacking, as Nina was saying, the socioeconomic system or uh, capitalism, which is reliant on mass extraction of resources and the destruction of the weather rest of the planet is uh, how people are deconstructing um, the current policy underlying the energy transition, which only perpetuates uh, these hegemonic uh, socioeconomic structures. So in a way it is uh, very similar. And what I, I also think it's important to highlight here is that often um, local communities are often accused of, of nimbyism, so this idea that, oh yes, mining elsewhere, but not in my backyard. Uh, and that is not true. And uh, local communities in Portugal are precisely building networks and networks of solidarity across Europe, across the world, with Serbia, with Chile, with Peru. Uh, I mean, Diego uh, has been to Apuzu and, um, and so many other um, environmental uh, justice activists, uh, practitioners, advocates, researchers have been to Bajozo or have been connected to Bajozo precisely to make this claim that um, decarbonization or transitioning or going green uh, should mean um, environmental and social justice across uh, countries, across regions, across territories, and not the sacrifice of, of traditionally peripheral uh, regions or territories or countries such as Portugal and Serbia, um, and not the continuous uh, extraction of the resources of the planet. And in that sense, I, I would like to go back to what uh, Diego and Maduri and, and Nina were mentioning, but really stressing, because I think here you both demystified these two myths uh, of Europe's exceptionalism. So what Diego was telling us is, yes, not in Europe, we don't do it better, actually. We have weaker legislation for, for in this case, mining, mining waste. So Europe does not necessarily do it better. So Europe is not an exception. And as Maduri was saying, actually, even if we would do it better, we still are reliant and we still, um, we perpetuate the reliance on mining in other countries, because for example, for lithium ion batteries, we need uh, other metals such as cobalt, which is only um, mined in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so I think these two myths are important to be demystified and hence take the, the discussion to another level. Because if we are continuously discussing allegedly solutions to uh, our mass consumption of energy and our mass production of energy, always in with the same frameworks of analysis, always with the same ideas and narratives that have brought us here. That I I don't think we're actually dis discussing solutions. And what I so I think uh, and bringing this also to one of the questions that uh, Maximilian has has um, asked us to reflect about about alternative solutions, alternative futures. Uh, I think the 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 the, the discussion here should really be about reducing or uh, how can we do differently by reducing, by recycling, by upcycling all of the minerals, metals that we have already uh, resourced and extracted, uh, all of the, for example, digital appliances, innovations, infrastructures that we have already built. And instead of always being in this paradigm of we need new and more, uh, so we need more lithium for new uh, technological infrastructures. Perhaps we could be uh, talking about how can we reduce uh, energy consumption and production in order to uh, have uh, different uh, and more sustainable lifestyles. And in the, with this, also to wrap up and pass on to another speaker, to, for example, Diego and at the European Environmental Bureau have done an incredible work so far uh, with this report that I'm always quoting at every meeting that I go to, which is Green Mining is a Myth, where they also um, mention several policies that the EU could already um, put in, in, 
place. And so for the audience that we have here, uh, digital rights advocates, lobbyists, and practitioners, uh, I think uh, key steps uh, that can be under, um, taken to reduce uh, not just the emissions and the carbon footprint, but also to reduce the need for more mining, the need for more extraction, the need for more consumption and production are possible even within the framework of uh, the current economic structures and the current the political um, structures uh, in, of the EU. Um, and so, yes, I would like to uh, highlight this idea that we need to demystify this, this myth that underlie the energy transition, but also take the discussion to another level and to really be, when we're discussing transition, then we should really be discussing, discussing a, a real, a more profound transformation of our uh, current uh, energy production and consumption structures and, rather than just a maintenance of them. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mariana, for already sketching out some of the alternatives that we will we uh, will be discussing indeed um, at the end of our of our conversation. Um, so maybe maybe we pass on to the second question, Diego. Um, and we we heard uh, Mariana saying that um, here this panel is about demystifying um, Europe's exceptionalism when it comes to when it comes to mining, and, and you've been doing a tremendous job at that in, in your introductory round. But maybe you take us maybe you take us back and you tell us what images and, and narratives and ideologies are being employed to to justify mining projects, and um, yeah, in, in especially in Europe. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that's a really good question. That's really at the core of this term, green extractivism, right? So we understand extractivism, particularly the first wave of extractivism. Well. If you want to really go the first wave, you have to go with the colonial age. But uh, more recent, more modern times, that extractivism is tied to fossil fuel extraction, right? We, we understand it's, it's extremely pervasive and, and, and really damaging to uh, particularly the Amazon and other regions as well. Now, green extractivism takes that core concept of extracting from the land, really not benefiting the local communities, and selling it to an international market, this commodity, right? But green extractivism now uh, basically recreates the violent structure under a climate agen agenda. And this becomes actually even more difficult to resist. Generally speaking, most people would say that fossil fuel extraction is bad, we should slow down, we should decrease it, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a connotation about what that means. When you put green extractivism, you complicate it, and basically it's also a means to, um, to uh, calm dissent or really to squash dissent, local dissent. There's many ways of framing it. For example, anti-development was usually one, but now it's anti-climate action. You, uh, civil society organizations or local resistance movements against lithium mining or nickel mining or coal mining, whatever, um, you're against the climate agenda because you're opposing it. They, they even um, label civil societies as being incoherent. You know, you push for green energy, and at the same time you're resisting these mining projects, it doesn't make sense. So they put us on the back foot, and then you have to defend yourself. And at that point, it becomes really, you've already captured the, the narrative. And the reason why this is extremely important is because for, to extract something, you have to win the minds and hearts, not necessarily of the people that are against, though yes, but of the general population that allows for this structure to exist in the first place. And the ways to do that is through propaganda. A major focus of that is propaganda. And not even on the local level, of course there is le uh, huge levels of propaganda on the local level, as, as our colleagues from the more local uh, uh, aspects could, could explain more, but even at the capital level. And this is, for example, in, in Sweden, which I've done some research as well, there is this uh, push, what is called the green mine, or, or the, sorry, the Swedish mine. And there's this connotation, basically, on billboards, you'll see, even at, uh, at uh, uh, subway stations, you'll see an image of a mining company, well, basically an open pit mine, in which have an idea, okay, that's really destructive. And then you have a really sleek, modern-looking electric vehicle right in the center, and a really, a man or a woman, really fashionable, looking cool, right? And this, it says, the Swedish mine. But what this does is, what it basically says is, okay, you have now captured the idea of what new mining looks like. Not only that, there's even a more pervasive, because now we're in the era of multiculturalism and what have you. So now there is uh, also images of a black woman, right? And she's doing her makeup. Uh, this is, by the way, on the billboards on the, uh, on the subway stations. And she's doing her makeup, and, on the and, and basically on her makeup, and then the mirror that she uses, blah, 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 
it has the um, elements, uh, uh, um, basically the letters of the elements, right, on there. So there's aluminum, there's copper, there's blah, blah, blah. And then basically what it says, the message that it says is um, that you use metals all your life. Your life revolves around metals. Uh, why not mine it in Sweden? I mean, they don't say that specifically, but that's the, the, the idea that they sell. And this is how propaganda is sold to people and completely erasing the many Sami indigenous communities that are seriously at risk. Uh, by the way, the Sami communities, in case people don't know, is the, one of the last indigenous, tri uh, indigenous communities in Europe. And I say last indigenous communities because in Europe we used to have indigenous communities, of course. We have, uh, over time, through history, uh, uh, they have either been assimilated or completely destroyed. And in the case of the Sami, they're the last. Um, so they're really fighting against this uh, extractivism, green extractivism happening in northern uh, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So it completely erases that history, right? They're not relevant. They don't exist. What exists now is modernity. You need this mind. You need the energy transition. And maybe I'll just put some really quick uh, uh, facts here because I think it's really important. Green extractivism is really copper, for example, or lithium. Well, the case of lithium is a bit more complicated. But let's look at the case of copper, which is even more. I would say copper is more necessary for the energy transition. Well, if you want to use those terms, then even lithium is, because lithium has an alternative, and that alternative is potentially sodium, which is able to is going to be able to bring down that lithium demand in the future. But copper is really it's really interesting because copper is highly unsust it's not very substitutable, right? You can use aluminium in certain capacity, but in general, you can't get that uh, corrosion resistance that you can in, in copper, or that malleability you can in copper, or conductivity, right? But anyway, so in the case of copper, for example. Copper is now also a green metal, supposedly. 40% um, of that, because I, I want to bring this point because Nina raised a really good point in terms of demand, right? 40% um, of the current demand uh, of projections for copper or, or use is from the construction sector. A huge chunk of that also comes from electronic goods. So we're talking about technology, right? At the moment, for copper, um, there's not, there's a projection, of course, how much we're going to need for the energy transition. We're just right now in 2023 or 2024 undergoing, so we haven't achieved it yet, right? So by that, I mean what this really highlights is the massive amounts of copper that are going to be needed for literally every sector. Everybody is competing for copper. So whether we want high technology or whether we want the energy transition, I mean, Eventually, society is, not, is going to have to come to terms of what's actually available. Because and the reason why I say that is because we're having serious supply crunches on the copper supply chain right now. Particularly in 2026, there's projections that demand is going to outstrip supply. Once that happens, prices go up, right? Once prices go up, you immediately make the energy transition much more costly. So there's going to be delays on actually how to transition. So I think Nina's point is, and, and, and Mariana's point is particularly important, is because right now society has a choice. We have a huge projection of demand that is going to be unmet, not only because we can't get mining projects uh, online fast enough for major reasons. One of them is local resistance for very good reasons. But then also society is going to have to come to terms with that. Okay, well, what are these metals actually going to go to? Do I need a phone every year? I'm sorry, but I don't. My iPad here is from 2019. I bought it secondhand. I'm perfectly happy with it. I don't need the latest model. So that's, that's what I'm saying. We're going to really need to get to a situation in which we have choices to make, whether we need the latest uh, uh, electronic device or whether we should be building uh, uh, you know, rooftop solar or you know, talk about uh, you know, low carbon energy. So this is, this is the, the issue that we're having. We're having, uh, just really quickly, we're having a, a choice to make, not only because um, geopolitics, but also we're just going to be forced to. The last copper mine that we actually found that, is, that has a substantial amount was 10 years ago. And copper ore has declined 25% in the last 10 years. I'm sorry, but this energy transition that we're really trying to achieve by the current demand is unachievable, not because it can't be done, just because we don't have the capacity to do it on a global scale. So choices to make, and this is where the topic of degrowth is really important because it's either a societal choice that we do that or it's nature that's going to push us to do that. And quite frankly, I think democratically speaking, we can probably have a better chance at societally deciding how that transition looks like, not being forced to make those harsh decisions 10 years from now. So yeah, I'll close it there.
Thanks, thanks, Diego, for uh, putting out some hard limits there and uh, maybe some ways on how to deal with those. Um, and uh, Diego was mentioning geopolitical competition, and I think that was also the direction that Maturi wanted us uh, wanted to take us with uh, the images, narratives, and ideologies underpinning underpinning extractivism and mining projects. Maturi, I'm going to hand it over to you again. I think I came across this really powerful statistic um, where might be bungling it, but it basically, you know, went along the lines of how a single electric vehicle has to be on the road for more than 90 years to justify the amount of emissions that were released in its construction, as well as the minerals that were extracted to produce it. And so, you know, just to give us a sense of how what an oxymoron um, this uh, kind of endeavor to go electric while making no changes in how we move and uh, exist in the world um, you know, can continue, that we can you know, have business as usual um, and just by replacing fossil fuel capitalism with a renewable power capitalism that we'll be okay. Um, but obviously, renewables have costs. They come from somewhere. They come from someone's homes. Someone's homes get destroyed. And so, you know, the material impacts are as manifold um, as, you know, fossil fuels and both manifest as well as uh, latent. Um, just, I think, listening to Mariana and Nina talk about kind of the greenwashing that goes on in local contexts where the justification is given that, you know, we need to continue with this particular resource extraction project because it's beneficial for the climate, it's beneficial for the green transition. It uh, reminded me of, you know, where I did field work in peninsular India several years ago, but that was for bauxite. And the rationale being given out by the Indian government at the time was that you know, we can't leave it under the ground because of national growth, right? And so, yes, some indigenous communities' rights and livelihoods were going to be sacrificed, but it had to because one couldn't, you know, possibly countenance the prospect of leaving minerals under the ground, but also that marginalized communities, right, historically, were always the ones who were being sacrificed for the purpose of um, national growth. And so just kind of extending that to the present context, I was really struck by how, you know, we're at a point where we're justifying indigenous um, dispossession and disenfranchisement on the ground of like global climate action. And it, it's just... Um, kind of egregious and, and really gives us a uh, pause, I think, to think that, you know, we've, that we are here now. Um, so um, to respond to your question, Max, I think, yes, the, you know, I think conversations um, that I've had with advocates kind of across the spectrum, you know, something that you hear repeatedly is that, you know, we can't, engineer our way out of this, we can't recycle our way out of this, and that the fact that the European Union is so committed to a future of growth, right, and industry and material self-sufficiency means that, you know, it's hunger for extraction is not going to cease anytime soon, be it domestically or abroad. And so, you know, we have to really think about how to also fight this um, climate justice advocacy battle on the narrative front where, you know, we have to be creative about how we can justify um, a paradigm shift like deep growth, right? And going back on ideas of limitless growth that we have, you know, really normalized as, um, the way forward. Yeah, thanks, Madhuri. 
Um, I would also love to hear from um, Nina and from Mariana about um, how green, green mining projects are being proposed to local communities and how they're being justified. But um, looking at the time, and uh, because I want to make some space for questions from the audience at the end, maybe we do a quick last round on our third question on uh, what future alternatives for tech and its making do you want to see? And then we're going to hand it over uh, to our lovely audience. So maybe each one of you gets one minute to, to briefly sketch their, their utopic vision. Nina, you, would you like to start? Um, sure, okay, one minute. Um, previously, I said that uh, there are going to be mines open up everywhere. Um, in the future, uh, we should be resisting also mines everywhere. So what I want to see in the future is even more solidarity between affected communities, which is already happening. Mariana touched upon this briefly, which reminded me also of the great initiatives that several communities affected by lithium mining started, um, sort of coming together in order to show that this is not the green future um, that we want. The future alternative that I want is one where there is an absolute minimum of electric vehicles. I want electric public transport. I want to know where the materials that are being mined are being used for. I want, um, I want sufficiency over efficiency. I want as little materials and as little environmental effect possible, and I want as much justice as possible. That's very beautiful. Thanks a lot, Nina. Mariana, what about you? What, that, was, that, was pretty, that was pretty sharp on, on, on the minute mark. Uh, Mariana, what about you? What's your utopic vision for, for tech uh, and tech's future? <laughs> uh, thank you, and thank you, Nina. Yes. Um, well, I, I think I would for sure agree with uh, the demand that Nina just, uh, just made. Um, so for me, alternatively, and as Diego was saying, we, have, we can make a choice uh, at this point in time, uh, and I think what we ought to make for choice right now is to reduce our car dependency, if we're speaking specifically of the mobility and energy transition, and as Nina said, invest in public transport, invest in electric public transport, invest in trains, so make the connection um, of mobility um, way more efficient, uh, as, as Nina said. Uh, when I think about technological uh, futures, I would also say we should reduce our dependency to electronic consumerism. As Diego uh, uh, brilliantly put it, we do not need the latest model, we do not need the latest innovation. And all of these ideas, and this is why I think to transition or when, to th when thinking about future alternatives, we need to think about future alternative narratives. The model of the good life does not need to be equated with having the latest car, having the latest iPhone, having the latest computer. The model of the good life doesn't need to be equated with consuming to be happy or needing more to be fulfilled. Um, and I think the model of the good life, so the narrative that we ought to have on our future, is to bring back autonomy, to bring back the right for people to repair, to upcycle, to recycle, the right, bring back autonomy to people who have lost the capacity to when something is broken, to repair it, be it electronic, to talk about tech, but be, be it our clothes. Um, and uh, we often don't have this, this mindset. We think that new is better, that more is better. And I think the narrative should be different. I think doing with what we have, reducing our dependency to external market um, innovation. Uh, and, and that means also fostering, as Nina was saying, uh, stronger senses of community, bring back the power uh, to local communities, um, to, to foster autonomy, foster uh, partial sufficiency. I'm not, I, if we uh, ought to be utopian, we could think about yeah, self-sufficiency for local communities uh, living off the land, uh, but uh, we don't need to go that far, far, far but we, we can uh, think about policies that foster a more circular, more local, um, uh, economies and political decision structures, uh, and I, I think that is achievable. And I think the narratives uh, that we uh, that we create, those are the ones that uh, ought to be changed. Because 
as Diego was saying, just right now we look at this publicity in Sweden and we are amazed and we think, brilliant, I want the mine in my country because precisely I want modernity, development, progress, uh, my new car and the makeup that goes with it. This is what we're sold. But if we start being sold something else, we can also uh, move uh, to that uh, different direction. And I see that my time is getting over. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mariana. Thanks for advocating against materialism and innovation and fostering community for and, and for fostering communities and and the good life for everyone. So, Diego, how does your how does your utopia look like? Yeah, just really shortly. And I think Mariana and Nina have already added so much of what I would have liked to say. So, I mean, I, maybe just I think it would be uh, really important to go back to the past to build a future. And in a sense, many of our material consumption back in the 1970s was actually within planetary boundaries. In 1970, we were using one planet. 40 years later, 50 years later, now we're using up to three. So we have to go back to that. And the quality of life in 1970s in Western Europe was not bad. It was actually quite good. So, and in many ways, better. In terms of health, at least, and life expectancy, it, it was better. Um, so these are the things that going back to build a future, right? And then maybe just one last thing, because I'm not against, I'm not a Luddite, right? I like technology, I like having things, but I want technology that builds community rather than keeps it apart. And Facebook or Instagram, whatever, there's aspects of it that are useful in the future. There's aspects that are not, particularly on the data extraction side, right? But then aside from this, this technological development, just really quickly, we also need to talk about why do people use, feel compelled to be on their phone so much, or feel compelled to be on their um, gaming systems, spend so much time on the gaming systems. And that is because many people feel isolated from each other. So in this sense, we need to build a community, as Mariana was saying, uh, but also, and honestly, I'm a strong advocate for this, we need to work less, because people that are stressed out use consume more, they use more technology, and we just need to work less so that we can have these times, this free time, to sure, spend it on uh, reading a book online or what have you, but also to build community, to go to that uh, 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 you know, community library and actually f fix your phone, to learn how to, I don't know, fix your washing machine or what have you. But um, yeah, so it, it's important to connect, I think, uh, working time reduction with technological development in the future and how those two can combine to really build a much more connected society, but in a way that is meant to build community and not to um, make us more individualistic. Please. Yeah, okay, and with that, we're, we're gonna end Privacy Camp for today. We can, I think, uh, I'll go home because work, work is done. Um, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over uh, to, con to conclude uh, this last round uh, to Maturi, and then I'm gonna hand it over to the audience. Thank you. I'm going to be really, really quick because big plus ones to everything that all three of you said and a plus hundred to community tool libraries. I just love the concept and uh, yeah, those, those spaces are jewels. Um, only to add, I would say the final demise of platform capitalism where, you know, all the social media platforms that we know uh, finally implode um, as they are uh, run by, you know, American uh, megalomaniacs who don't know any better and are spouts of uh, climate misinformation and disinformation that we don't need. And uh, more of community-run digital public spaces where, you know, they are run for people to organize and advocate and uh yeah powered by you know local um communities local you know data centers just all decentralized um and less overall less yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot to everyone here on stage um I would open the floor maybe for two questions, for two quick questions, and then um, we're gonna conclude the session. Uh, I have one in the back from, an, uh, okay, we get, we take one in the front first, and then one in the back. Thank you for this very important discussion. Um, as uh, Diego suggested with propaganda, 
uh, I was attacked on social media for uh, criticizing electric vehicles. And uh, it's not a question, it's a suggestion. I replied with something that diffused the attack. I said, uh, would you prefer uh, driving an electric vehicle or drinking water? Yeah, thanks, for, thanks for the suggestion. Yeah. My question was a bit more like practical. First of all, thank you so much for this conversation. It was really amazing and I heard like synergies and avenues for change at different levels. So legal, you talked a bit about community, building field more, but also like public opinion. So my question to all of you, um, whoever has ideas is practically, how do you see the digital and environmental justice hmm, practitioners working together? Like, do we need to like, I don't know, uh, paint over those propaganda ads <laughs> to work on the public opinion bit? Do we need to have uh, like lobby coalitions to work on the legal field? Like practically, what? how do you see some uh, concrete synergies happening? Yeah, thanks, that, that's a lovely question. I, I wanted to ask it myself, but um, th thanks Andrea for bringing it up. And uh, maybe we take one more question from the audience and then you get uh, the quick chance to answer. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm Marco, I'm a climate justice activist, and uh, I would like to ask you, Diego, a question related to the fact that um, you shared about the waste uh, of mining as an intergenerational issue, and uh, I myself am not like from a community affected from mining, uh, but I hear like within climate justice environment that we speak a lot about like, for example, the, the waste from um, uh, at, like e atomic energy, but I never heard uh, about uh, mining waste, uh, wh whereas they, as I understand it, they last forever, both of them. W what do you think is the reason for it? Okay, um, maybe who would like to start answering the question on, on the coalitions? I don't mind start talking. Yeah, please, please go ahead, Mariana, yeah. Ah, no, 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 go ahead. I was, I wasn't seeing any movement, so <laughs> I could jump in. But, or I, I can start and then you can follow up. <laughs> um, go ahead, go ahead, Maria. No, Mariana, please go ahead. It's, okay, okay, okay. We're, yeah. all, we're all yours. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. No, thanks for the, for the, for the question. I, I think, um, I'm, I mean, as you already sort of answered, I think we need a diversity of tactics and strategies. Uh, what I've been seeing with um, going against the narrative of the energy transition and of the digital transition as it is being projected right now, so not necessarily against the transition, but against how it is being planned, uh, is that I've seen, uh, and, and this is what I think environmental practice, there is advocates, activists, speaking to, is act both on the legal side, both on the advocacy, lobbying side, so in Brussels, obviously, uh, these coalitions of advocates have the possibility to speak uh, with be it uh, policymakers, with deputies, and this is something that local communities um, have also done. Uh, for example, in Brussels, we went twice uh, to an audition uh, at the European Parliament and at the European Commission. But these are, for these, of course, local communities need to be boosted and helped uh, by uh, people who are close centers, then I think envir environmental advocates should also be present for some of the media by, yeah, be it on social, social media, be it on more traditional media, then of course organizing or helping organize uh, protests, but also boycotts. I would like to mention this because, for example, in the case of Bohonzo, and I know similar cases, the mining company is actually a stock exchange company, it's not a mining company. I mean, the current CEO has already said they do not want even to mine this project. They want to sell the license to someone else. So, of course, this is a business. This is profit-making for them. Uh, their business is to sell to the highest bid uh, these uh, environmental li this mining licensing. Uh, and I think targeting um, the investors or uh, with with well thought, well planned um, strategies and narratives can also be a way of environmental practices and advocates who um, are further away from local communities 
um, to help. Uh, and then, of course, yes, offer legal help, as uh, you said, and offer uh, alternatives. This is something I think the I always take the case of the European Environmental Bureau that Diego works for does very well. So presenting reports uh, that get to uh, the Brussels decision centers and that present not just the critique but also alternatives uh, on how uh, can e the EU do differently and do better. Um, and I, I, I say I would think that working if we would see all these environmental practices working together, we would have. I mean, we are already having good results, or we have to be hopeful that we continue this, this, this good results, but we would have even better results, I would say. I can respond to Andrea's question on uh, coalition building between um, tech advocacy and climate justice folks. So yeah. I think, you know, I have one, kind one, of a, one last minute, and then you're, you're going to lead, lead us out of the conversation, Maturi. <laughs> and I'm going um, to relegate the question that was asked to Diego to, because, because we are here physically, so I think you, you can answer that in private after the conversation. Thanks. I mean, the only point I want to make is that, you know, climate philanthropy, climate grant makers particularly are very steeped in tech optimism. And, you know, there's a lot of resources, particularly from big um, grant organizations like Bezos Fund, being put towards tech and data tools, particularly towards you know forest conservation and ecosystem management. And I think digital rights folks have a big, big contribution to make in terms of you know just sharing their expertise on data governance, data sharing, just the dangers of you know giving over big data repositories on our planetary resources to monopoly corporations. And I think digital rights folks often take that domain knowledge for granted. But, you know, even a term like tech optimism is certainly not mainstream amongst, you know, foresters, conservationists. And so I think there is a lot to be done there in terms of just exchanging expertise in these really focused ways. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks so much for, for being here as an audience and engaging, and I'm, so, I'm sorry I didn't allow for more time uh, for, for questions and answers at the end. Uh, thanks so much, Maturi, Mariana, Diego, and Nina for, for being here, for sharing your insight and sharing uh, your struggles um, here on stage. Thanks again for Edri uh, for having us here, and um, I wish you uh, a, lot of, a lot of fun here at, at Privacy Camp.